I'm Tim Reddy. I'm the director of the Lewis Walker Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnic Relations. And by the way, Lewis Walker is sitting right, right here in, uh, in front of us. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, a member of the Sociology Department, and I'm also on the Shared Prosperity Kalamazoo Organizing Committee. Uh, there is a, uh, uh, a partnership between Shared Prosperity Kalamazoo in the city of Kalamazoo with Western Michigan University uh, with our intention to see how we can harness uh, the Broncos, so to speak, uh, to uh, address, help address the issues uh, that uh, we're working on in Shared Prosperity Kalamazoo, addressing, uh, uh, you know, to the flip side of, of prosperity is poverty, uh, but we're focusing on the positive, what it is that we aspire to. Uh, in particular, we're looking at uh, youth development, st uh, strong and secure, uh, families and better access to well-paying jobs. Um, and uh, in that uh, light, we did some research um, and I happened to come across uh, this uh, article in a publication from Stanford written by somebody that uh, uh, I won't say I'd never heard of, but I had forgotten that I had heard of uh, uh, Melody Barnes. Uh, uh, and the, the, the more I uh, looked into who this person was, I said, oh my God. Uh, what, a, what a person. Uh, I won't get into her uh, resume. Uh, we have uh, someone uh, in the person of uh, Dr. Ed Montgomery, uh, president of our university, who uh, worked with uh, uh, Ms. Barnes uh, in the Obama administration. So Dr. Montgomery. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tim. Uh, so good evening. Uh, it's really uh, a pleasure to be here and to welcome you all to Western Michigan University at this event sponsored by Shared Prosperity Kalamazoo, the city of Kalamazoo, and obviously our Lewis Walker Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnic Relations. I uh, really appreciate you guys organizing this and bringing us together to have this kind of conversation uh, around both this country uh, and around the world uh, around democracy. What is its future? Uh, and so uh, we've got, we're honored to have one of the best thinkers around on any topic, but in particularly this one, Melody Barnes. Um, uh, I want to welcome her to the campus. I have known Melody uh, in a variety of different hats, some that she may or may not even remember how far back we go. Um, uh, from uh, early days uh, that I think trace the kinds of things that she's been involved with. Uh, she uh, has a uh, bachelor's degree from University of North Carolina and a, and a law degree from University of Michigan. She has spent time on, uh, working at the Equal Opportunity Commission. She has spent time working for Senator Kennedy on the Judiciary Commission. She has worked, spent time running the Center for American Progress, one of the most progressive think tanks uh, as they thought about the juncture at the end of the, the Bush administration and laying out an agenda. Uh, for the next president and the next administration. That's a project that I first met uh, uh, Melody on when we thought about, brought together a whole set of people from all types of policy areas, everybody from national security to environmental policy, to think about what a new president's agenda would be. And we were blessed to, to have uh, President Obama elected. And uh, it turned out we both worked on his campaign at different parts uh, of that. And then we both worked on the transition at different parts of that. Uh, and then uh, got to work uh, with her in the administration. So she ran the Domestic Policy Council, and for those of you who don't know what that is, she was a full-time herder of cats trying to get people together uh, to try and address some of the biggest challenges. She walks in the door, we're losing 600,000 jobs a minute, uh, a, a month. We are going into the deepest recession since the Great Depression. The banks are closing, foreclosures are going, poverty is skyrocketing, we have millions of uninsured people and she's put in charge of domestic policy. <laughs> think, of, think about a great hand. By the time she left, jobs were being created by the millions. We had the American, uh, the ACA had been passed. Uh, we had a livable cities initiative. Poverty was starting to come down. And this is in no small part due to her and the efforts of her team uh, and, and obviously the leadership of, of the president in wrangling that kind of agenda. So one, incredibly smart incredibly skilled, a great manager, 
a someone who has spent her life thinking about social justice, thinking about how to improve our society. And so today's topic about democracy and, and the, the future of our democracy, I think, is, is, a, is a natural progression for her. Thinking about uh, where we are as a society, where are we in terms of our faith in our institutions, and where does that fit inside the, the great American experiment uh, where we have this representative democracy. So I can't wait uh, to hear from her to, uh, because not only does she think about problems, but she actually thinks about solutions to problems. And so we're blessed to have Melody Barnes here to address today. Welcome. Her. Well, thank you so much, Ed, for that introduction. As you were saying all those things, I was thinking, my mother couldn't have done a better job than that. I was like, <laughs> that was really, really heartwarming. And to that end, I also have to say this uh, about you. You, when you spend difficult times with someone, really challenging times with someone, as we did at the beginning of the Obama administration, you start to understand a person's character and their metal, what they're made out of. And I can tell you, and my guess is that you already know this, that your president is someone who is determined, who is visionary, who is compassionate and caring, all at the same time. He is a fantastic leader, so I am really, really happy for your community, for your students, for your faculty, um, because you are here to lead this, or this university. So well, thank congratulations, you. Thank, thank you. you. And I had a wonderful afternoon with Tim um, and everyone affiliated with Shared Prosperity Kalamazoo. It's rare that you're in the room with someone whose name sits on an institute that helps to bring you to a, a city. So that's also been quite an honor and I enjoyed it so much. I hope those in the room also enjoyed it as much as I did. But I have to say, this isn't my first time in Kalamazoo. As I've told some people, my law school roommate is from Kalamazoo. And uh, the last time I was here, I think, was 1988. Uh, and I was a second year in law school, and we were visiting her family. So it is wonderful to be back here. This evening, um, as Ed mentioned, I'm going to talk some about democracy and our vision for democracy and the role and responsibility that we have as citizens in a democracy. Um, I don't think you would disagree with me if I said that we don't have to look very far or certainly if you pick up the newspaper or if you are bold enough to flip through news channels to understand the kinds of challenges that are facing our country today. And in fact, if you do, chances are you are angry, or frightened, or angst-ridden, or anxious, or any number of emotions when you consider the challenges that stand in front of us. It is easy to feel overwhelmed right now. But at the same time, it is important to remember this. We've never been perfect. We've never been perfect. And my friend John Meacham, he and I sit on a board together uh, in Charlottesville has written a book called The Soul of America, The Battle for Our Better Angels. And I see some people nodding. And I'll just read you a quote from it. He said, there's a natural tendency in American political life to think that things were always better in the past. I mean, there's that nostalgia, right? The passions of previous years fade to be inevitably replaced by the passions of the present. Nostalgia is a powerful force, and in the maelstrom of the moment, Many of us seek comfort in imagining that there once was a Camelot, without quite remembering that the Arthurian legend itself was about a court riven by indiscretion, ambition, and infidelity. And John goes on to remind us, quote, imperfection is the rule, not the exception. So even as our historical battle lines remain entrenched, I remain optimistic. And I know some of you are thinking, is she crazy? <laughs> but I do remind, opt remain optimistic, even as I see years of the work that I did, that Ed did, being attacked, I still believe in the fact that we have progressed. We have moved forward. Our country has changed. And more people today have more rights and more liberties than they ever have before. And I just think about it, 100 years ago, it would have been unimaginable that I could have been here speaking to this audience 
And it probably would have been unimaginable that some of, some of you could have been in this audience. You think about it, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Richmond was once this nation's second largest slave port. A hundred, no, sorry, 500,000 enslaved men, women, and children were bought and sold in the Shaco Bottom of Richmond. And yet, I have a college education. I have a law school education. I was chief counsel to one of the most productive senators in US history, Senator Ted Kennedy. And I worked for the first African American president. If you had taken that script to Hollywood 75 years ago, they would have probably sent you to the comedy or the science fiction department <laughs> with that script. It is almost unimaginable. And I'm sure many of you could tell similar kinds of stories. Many of you know what it means to be poor. Many of you probably understand what it means to bump into the glass ceiling or the locked door or the sticky floor. You know what it means to have to force your way into opportunity. So our lives are proof of progress. And at the same time, there is so much more to do. So what does that mean for us in 2018 as we confront today's challenges. So I would argue that we should pay attention to that great 20th century philosopher, Michael Jackson, <laughs> and we should start with the man in the mirror. And in all seriousness, what I mean by that is that we have the responsibility to confront and contribute to the resolution of the challenges that are facing our democracy today. And we can begin here at home. And as someone who has spent much of her life working on the federal level, I am not saying that national government is unimportant. I am not saying that the federal government is unimportant. In fact, I believe that a strong, efficient, effective federal government is absolutely necessary. Because what happens at the federal level is often the protection of some of our most important rights. The federal government must set a floor for what is right and the rights that we must have. And it also allows us to address institutional and systemic problems and to do that at scale. Not, and it was one of the reasons I wanted to work at the federal government. Yes, it's important we can help 1,000 people or 10,000 people, but what happens when we have systemic change and we can help millions of people at the same time? That's why I believe that the federal government is important. But we, the people, are the core to the strength of our democracy. And the work being done in our communities, including here in Kalamazoo, can provide a guiding light, can provide a pathway for the rest of the country to follow. And so as a student of history, I was a history major at the University of North Carolina, I understand and I believe that it can be our greatest guide in helping us understand how we move forward. So what I would like to do is to go back for a minute and look at some of the lessons that we can learn from the past, what we must take from the past, and then examine some of the big challenges in front of us and a pathway forward. So I want to start with the conception of the original American idea. Now, for some of you, that may have struck panic in your hearts. You're like, oh my god, history. <laughs> so are there, any, are there any history majors, history buffs in the audience? Not a rhetorical question. OK. <laughs> Are there people on the flip side who absolutely cannot stand talking about history? Be honest. OK, I see there is like, I, I admire and respect your honesty, <laughs> the woman in the back. So just hang with me for a second um, as we talk about this. For those who love history, you may remember the Articles of Confederation. Anybody, Articles of Confederation. If you don't, there's good reason. They were not worth the paper they were written on. Um, <laughs> But that was the way America first came together. I mean, we had this war, and we put together the articles, and there was to establish a firm league of friendship. Did not work. It did not provide us with a governing structure that would allow us to move forward as a nation. And in fact, states were just kind of doing their own thing. My home state of Virginia was by itself trying to negotiate a trade deal with France for wine. We couldn't tax anybody, which 
people may think is a good idea, but we also couldn't manage big national conflict. And when finally there was bloodshed in Massachusetts and Shays' Rebellion, you know, the great founders of the country said, whoa, we got ourselves a problem and we've got to figure this out. So off they go to Philadelphia to draft a constitution. That was obviously an important moment. It was, in fact, a, the Ameri what I call America's first perfecting moment. We weren't getting it right, so how do we turn this around? And that was what the Constitution was intended to do. But at the same time, with this great Constitution and this idea that we, are armed with our own rights and liberties, could self-govern ourselves and send people to Congress to help us, to help shape our nation, at the same time, we made some big, big mistakes. And one of those big mistakes is that we left out so many people who were already here in the United States. At that time, we came up with the idea of who could vote and who could participate, and those were mostly landed white men. So poor white men, Native Americans, women, blacks, whether you were free or slave, were left out of that essential contract. And in fact, when Thomas Jefferson was left to think about, well, what is it that we've done? Thomas Jefferson wrote, but as it is, we have the wolf by its ear, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is in one scale and self-preservation in the other, because we had also compromised and committed one of America's original sins in our compromise around slavery. So we've got this country founded on pluralism and tolerance and all of these great ideas but we weren't living up to that. And it was important for us to understand that in those, with those decisions, we were going to have to figure out a way forward. So just as our founders gave us these big challenges, they also gave us the tools to figure it out. And in fact, when Jefferson and Madison were writing each other in 1787 as the Constitution was being considered, they also said, look, and this is a quote, if they approve of the, appro the proposed convention, which is the Constitution and all its parts, I shall concur in it cheerfully, Jefferson wrote, in hopes that they will amend it whenever they find that it work wrong. In other words, if they find out that we've screwed up, let them fix it. They ought to do it. And in fact, we have. So you look 100 years later, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment, and then they served as, as a catalyst for the 19th Amendment and for women to have the right to vote. So all of a sudden, we're taking steps to try and bring more people into this American contract. But even with that, we know that our work is far from done. Steve Levitsky and Daniel Ziblatt have written recently um, a really interesting and important book, I think, called How Democracies Die. And they wrote, the simple fact of the matter is that the world has never built a multi-ethnic democracy in which no particular ethnic group is in the majority and where political equality, social equality, and economies that empower all have been achieved. And I pause just to stop and think about that. We have never, ever, anywhere in the world built that kind of democracy. Never. Not even here. So what does that mean for us, again, in 2018? Where do we go from here? And I would say, you know, there are lots of issues, and we have certainly have seen and worked on lots of issues. But I put them into three big categories. First of all, most Americans are feeling the economic sands shifting under their feet. And they feel the income insecurity that is just crisscrossing America. It knows no boundaries, not geography, not race, not gender, not ethnicity. And that institution, that kind of insecurity, however, is exacerbated by issues of race and gender and institutionalized and systemic barriers and disparities. Second, those dramatic shifts in American demography are contributing to a really interesting moment right now. The shifts raise important questions and also quite a bit of discomfort, as we know and as we see, about American identity and why or why not the American dream is even possible. And finally, as a result of the first two, there's a lot of angst in our society that threatens democratic participation and norms and institutions 
making us less capable of addressing the big challenges that people face, the kinds of challenges that you hear your friends and your colleagues or when you pick up the paper, and I've been reading your papers recently, you pick up the paper and you find the kinds of things that people are struggling with, we're less capable of addressing those problems because of the kind of friction that we have. So let's start with the economic challenges. Throughout American history, American confidence has typically been pretty high. Even at times of national strife, typically, we have felt as though the American dream was in within our grasp. And in fact, I remember when I was on the campaign in 2007, 2008, and I was speaking all over the country. I, I was some of everywhere. You know, North Carolina, I was in Pennsylvania, I was in Colorado, I was in Montana. People were like, you were, you were in Montana? <laughs> you all thought you could win in Montana? But we felt if you didn't ask for a vote, you didn't deserve the vote. So yes, I was in Montana. And everywhere I would, I would go, I would also often say to people, do you believe in the American dream? And the vast majority of people would raise their hand. I strongly believe if I ask that question today, I don't even know if half the people in the room would raise their hand and answer that question in the positive. So even though we have seen that kind of confidence over time, we know that today people often feel that America's best days are behind us. There's a collapse in, the, in confidence that surrounds us because people believe that the American dream whether you're a person of color and you've struggled generation after generation after generation to grasp the American dream or not, that it just doesn't seem to be real. And no matter the cause, whether it's globalization or whether it's technology or whether or not you believe that you're not adequately prepared to participate in today's economy, we know that Americans are hurting regardless of race and gender. And at the same time, as a result of that, social mobility and economic mobility and income inequality are starting to rise. Income inequality in the U.S. has been steadily increasing since 1980, with notable increases over the last 15 years. And in fact, between 1973 and 2000, the richest one-fifth of Americans saw their family income grow by about 66% while those at the bottom quintile saw their family income grow by only about 12%. The Gini coefficient, which if you study Gini coefficients, you know that's a measure of income inequality in national economies, and it ranges on a scale from zero to one, with one being the most unequal. And now, America's Gini coefficient is about 0.48, so about middle of the road. We're worse off than some of the countries that we consider to be some of our largest enemies, some of the countries where we believe people are being treated most unfairly. And those trends are manifesting their way in American life in ways that are having a dire effect on Americans. We are also watching mortality rates rise, and I'm sure you all have been reading about this. In recent years, we've seen, in particular, an, an interest in the fact that middle-aged, working-class, white men and women are seeing their mortality rates go up. They are seeing, at the same time, a lack of attachment to the labor market. We are seeing greater use of alcohol and drugs. We're seeing a greater increase in obesity, less access to, uh, to food and to common everyday needs and uh, survival. And as a result of that, we're seeing an increase in suicides and the use of alcohol and drugs at a rate that's causing people's lives to crumble underneath them. And in the communities of color where we were seeing mortality rates kind of stabilize, we're seeing mortality rates start to pop back up in those communities as well. This idea of deaths of despair has been written about by a couple of, of uh, economists at Princeton, and they argue that Baby boomer whites who don't have college degrees are experiencing poor health and mental health and social isolation and lack of attachment to the labor market. They're seeing the disappearance of jobs, low-skill jobs in construction and manufacturing, and thus that feeling that the American dream is becoming more and more and more elusive for them. And as a result, we're seeing these self-destructive activities that are leading to this rise in mortality. 
At the same time, some of you may have read about the work of uh, an economist on the West Coast called Raj Chetty. And I don't know if some of you even saw, there was a, an article in the New York Times a couple of months ago that focused on some of his recent research that shows what's happening to black boys as compared to their white counterparts, but who are middle class and upper middle class. If you haven't seen it, I advise you to look this up because the graphic is jarring. What it represents is the fact that even those who are in the middle class or upper middle class, black boys are more likely to end up not staying in the class in which they were born, but falling into lower income strata as a result of race. With African American girls, we're seeing something that looks better as compared to their counterparts, but both white women and African American women and Latino women are not doing as well as white men. So we see these issues of race and gender playing out in our economy as well. I also mentioned this issue of, this, of our changing demography and American identity. Economic stress isn't new to us. It's something we've confronted as a country for quite some time. But what's different right now is the changing face of America. And most of us understand this data and have heard this data. We know that by the year 2030, the majority of workers under 25 will be people of color. We know by year 2042, the majority of all workers will be people of color. And we know that by the year 2050, the majority of Americans will be people of color. What we also know is that by the very virtue of the fact that because in our lifetimes, we will live in a multicultural society, does it mean that we are prepared to live in a multicultural society? Americans have wildly different views when asked about this issue. And when asked whether or not the mixing of global cultures in the United States is a good thing, wildly different views. Whether Christian beliefs are culturally foundational, very different views. And in fact, when even asked if diversity is a good thing, wildly dif different views. What they can agree on is that the sense of American identity is unraveling. But what they can't agree on is what is American identity? Who are we? So this perception that we are in America lost is taking hold even at the same time that our future is telling us that we are going to look very different than we did 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And that is having an effect on our institutions and the way that we engage with one another. The fact that we can't find consensus also isn't new, but partisanship tethered to sharply different worldviews is making it hard to get anything done in Washington. We have certainly lived through that. But at the same time, even though Americans are sending people to Washington who have that same kind of angst and frustration that they have, they're also losing frustration with the fact that nothing can get done in Washington. When you look at the Pew Research Center research, they show that since 2007, no more than 30% of Americans claim that they can trust our government. In 2017, only 18% of Americans said they could trust government in Washington to do what is right all or most of the time. And in fact, Senator Michael Bennett from Colorado often has said that Congress, which has a rating in the single digits, is about as popular, truly, as the IRS or Nixon during Watergate. People just don't trust the government. Americans have a strong sense that little is happening there, that there's little productivity. But when something does happen there, they often just don't like it. They don't agree with it. Um, and so we are frustrated and divided, and there is a churn around that frustration. And when political scientists measure this polarization, they find that we are as polarized now as we were in the late 1800s. And think about what that period was. That's post-Civil War. That's during the time of Reconstruction. That's a lot of friction and angst and fissures. And so not surprisingly, that does affect our productivity. Exacerbating that challenge are the threats to and posed by our media. The good news and the bad news about the media is this. The good news is that a vast majority of Americans believe that the media has an important role to play in a democracy. The bad news is that most adults don't think that the, this media is doing it. And only about 44% of them say, I can identify a source in the media that I think is objective. The views often are split on party lines. 
and people believe that there are too many sources. There's too much coming at us. I don't know what it means. And as a result, what they're paying attention to are those sources that they agree with. So as opposed to the media playing the role of giving us all information and, and helping us come together and form consensus so that we can move forward, people are isolating themselves in bubbles and they are paying attention to that which, which, with which they agree. agree. And it is harder for them to separate fact from fiction and certainly to make informed civic decisions. So when we step back from all of this, all of this, the division, the change, the angst, the economic insecurity, the rising mortality rates, and look at it, it's not hard to believe that we are having a challenge upholding our responsibility as citizens in the United States. As I mentioned before, I think what we have been given, with all of its challenges, is a gift. It was actually genius. I personally and I've traveled a lot of places, I would choose to live nowhere else. But at the same time, we have to realize that we've got to find a way out of this conundrum. Political participation is down, people feel frustrated. We know now that even as political participation has declined, it's even worse among those who are low income, who often believe that voting is a sham that I will get nothing out of this. So people don't believe in their system and don't want to participate, even though as citizens, with that founding gift of representational government, we have to, we have to participate. It our government requires and needs us. So what is it that we are to do? And why, if you remember what I said several minutes ago, why in the world do I feel optimistic? I've just said all this stuff. Why does she feel optimistic? So that brings me back here to Kalamazoo and back to communities all over the country that are dealing with these kinds of challenges. Here in Kalamazoo, the same kinds of things that I've mentioned are going on in the country. Many of them are happening here. You know better than I that you are digging out of what people call the lost decade of the 2000s in terms of loss of jobs and loss of income. Um, we also know that while in, the economy is improving, and, I, and Kalamazoo is certainly improving even better than many parts of Michigan. At the same time, people are stu struggling with challenges that in many cases are generations old. And by 2050, 40% of those who are living in Michigan will be people of color. And that's a, an opportunity, but it's also a challenge given some of the disparities that we know exist. So it's important work that's got to happen at the federal and state level but it's also critically important to focus on what you all are already doing here at home. As I said earlier today, I spent some time with a group of stakeholders talking about shared prosperity Kalamazoo. And that follows on the Kalamazoo promise. And as many of you know, that is about a decades old, 12 or 13 year old uh, program that was anonymously funded and provides 100% tuition to graduates of the Kalamazoo Public Schools so they can go to a Michigan college or university with the idea that if we give people additional skills, if we give them a good education, that we can start to lift our economy, people can come home and we can strengthen our community. And Shared Prosperity Kalamazoo was intended to follow on with that and to focus on economic development and strengthening uh, the supports that we give our children, strengthening the economic supports that we give our families, and improving opportunities and, job and um, employment pathways for individuals. And to do that, your sectors came together. Nonprofit, business sector, government, you know, your mayor, phil philanthropy, all came together to focus on how you were going to improve your community. What I think is so important about that is that engagement with the community. The fact that the success of this program and of these efforts here on the ground in your community requires collaboration and for everyone to sit at the table. Business leaders at the table, college presidents at the table, students at the table, residents, everyone has to come together and has a role to play to get this right. There are similar kinds of community focused place-based efforts like this all over the country. 
I've been a part of those efforts in Boston, Massachusetts, in Hopi, Arizona, in Del Norte, California, in Greenville, Mississippi, in Baltimore, I could go on. And they are all trying to do the same kind of work that you are doing with everyone recognizing that it is critical that individuals and residents be involved. That's going to ensure that we're building capacity inside our communities. That also ensures that we're starting to address generations old systemic disparities because we're focused not just on great programs, but we're focused on how do we change this, these big systems? Not how do we change the problem from five years ago, but how do we change the problem from 50 or 500 years ago? And it also will allow us to build racially and ethnically strong, diverse communities. I think that work is so important, and work at the local level is so important, even as we are watching the angst and the swirl and the friction at the federal level, because it requires us to do this. It requires us to be proximate with one another. I don't know how many of you have read the book Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. Yeah, I see you like, oh yeah. Um, for though, first of all, for those of you who haven't, run, don't walk to buy the book or download this book and read it. It is amazing. Brian is, um, I met Brian for the first time probably 25 years ago. He is a lawyer that focuses on uh, death penalty work. And he now runs his own shop in Alabama. He just opened um, the, this new Civil Rights Museum in Alabama um, that is focusing on l lynchings across America, um, which is an, ex an extraordinary project. And in Just Mercy, um, he writes about the importance of people being proximate. And it sounds almost like a simple thing, but I think it is an absolutely critical thing. It means that when we come in contact with one another, when we start to look one another in the eye, when we start to have conversations with people not like us, people who may disagree with us about what the problems are, what the challenges are, we can start to find our way forward. We can also realize for all the things that make us different, there are so many things that connect us to one another. It may require us to be uncomfortable, and may require us to rethink some of the things that we thought before. But ultimately, that's critical in the way that we form and strengthen our communities. And believe it or not, with everything that's happening in Congress today, it's one of the things that I remember seeing in the Congress that I worked in when I first got there when I was 28 years old. It's one of the things that I remember Senator Kennedy talking to me about. In fact, in his oral history, he talks about the importance of the fact that they were all there together. It wasn't just that Congress was in session two days a week and then they'd go off and they'd fundraise half the time, but they were day there, day in, day out, working together, kids in the same, on the same softball team, maybe going to the same church. And so you start to see people differently. And when you start to do that, it means Lindsey Graham and Ted Kennedy can work together. It means Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy can work together because they are proximate with one another. So we have the opportunity in neighborhoods and cities and towns all over the country to break down barriers, to understand our problems in a different way, to respect diverse experiences, to listen to different voices that we bring to the table, to respect those voices in a different way, and to address the critical issues that are confounding our community, and at the same time, use those experiences to shine a light on what we have to do on the federal level. You know, one of my former colleagues, one of our former colleagues, um, Kathleen Sebelius, was also a governor before she was a cabinet secretary. This is someone who worked at the federal level, at the highest levels of federal government, who will still say, yeah, what, what, ha what happens locally is what drives what happens nationally. So what you are doing here in Kalamazoo, what is happening in communities all over the country can be a model, can, be, can serve as the flywheel, can serve to animate and to catalyze what has to happen on a national level. You know, one of my all-time heroes, 
is someone named Barbara Johns. And uh, she is a Virginian, so I claim that. Um, and when she was 16 years old, and she was living in Prince Edward County, Virginia, she led a walkout of her high school. She was 16 years old. And she did that because her segregated high school, she felt was just not a place where she and her peers could or should learn. Tar paper roof often was leaking. They didn't have a cafeteria. They didn't have proper books. And all she wanted was a better school for herself and for her peers. So at 16, Barbara managed with a few peers to trick her teachers at a time when the high school principal was out of the building such that she called an assembly and all the students came to the auditorium. And she told, and I still can't believe this, and my mother was a teacher and there are a lot of educators in this room, but she said to the teachers, you need to leave. And they left. <laughs> this, is, this is fact, not fiction. They left. And what she said to her peers in this high school was we deserve better and we need to walk out and we need to protest until we can get better. And she led those students out of that school for a walkout of the Moton High School. And in spite of death threats, in spite of intimidation, and ultimately Barbara had to leave Virginia um, and go to live with her uncle down south for a while. Um, but in spite of all of that, they created a movement. And they called two famous lawyers, Spotswood Robinson and Oliver Hill, also a Richmonder, um, and asked for their help. And they said, okay, you know, they're busy trying these uh, desegregation cases all over the country, but okay, you know, we'll talk to you. And they did, and what they learned was about the tenacity of young people in this community. And what they said to her is, if you are willing to fight not for a better segregated school, but for desegregated schools, we will take your case. And ultimately, that case was rolled into Brown versus Board of Education. That's what a 16-year-old girl did in her community. Local can transform the state, can transform the country. And what I believe today is that it is important to understand that power sits with us. Power sits with the people. It doesn't matter your age or your gender or your race or your ethnicity. Progress can begin where you are. So starting here in Kalamazoo, you can teach the rest of the country, the rest of the state, what it means to do something transformative for your community and to participate in a new way forward alongside your neighbors. And that, I believe, is the promise of democracy. Thank you. Melody uh, would be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Not all at once. <laughs> <laughs> so, Melody, now that Congress uh, comes back on Tuesdays and leaves on Thursdays, you don't get them uh, in proximity to each other. Mm -hmm. How do we get that, that the, the good old days to be the good old days <laughs> back? Is there a solution to that? Well, I mean, I do think the rules, those kinds of rules have to change, um, and they flirt with them from time to time. But ultimately, you know, as we know, Congress pays attention to its constituents. Now, while they will say, well, I'm going home to be among my people, often they're going home to be among fundraisers. Um, and that, unfortunately, is also the name of the game. But I think that constituent pressure um, for action, for activity, and, and for collaboration. I, I think consensus has become such a dirty word um, in Congress that people seem to be uh, prized for their unwillingness to, to, to move forward to form compromise as opposed to their willingness to do so. At the same time, there are structural things that we can do to encourage that. I mean, there's uh, effort underway. One of our former colleagues, Eric Holder, 
um, is quite active in this and thinking about how we draw, draw district lines so that we have um, greater diversity inside of our districts, which would then require people to not just listen to a homogenous set of people, whoever that happens to be, but to listen to greater diversity, which then may, requires you in Congress to engage with different kinds of people to form um, solutions and to come together to compromise, um, to not feel endangered or that your seat may be endangered if you come up with compromise. So I think they're both structural things. I think that there's constituent pressure um, that can be um, placed to bear so that Congress has to start to act differently because they will want to and will need to reflect the desires and wishes of their constituents. Yes. How do you feel the momentum to change? So like Kalamazoo has this very large homeless population mm -hmm. now. Um, they were sleeping out in the park. Most recently a lot of them got arrested. But how do you feel that momentum to where it's a positive and impact to change? Well, what I've seen in a number of communities and um, I sit on the board of the Marguerite Casey Foundation. I'll use this as an example. We fund communities in 13 states where there are extremely high levels of childhood poverty. So we fund a lot in the Deep South, um, California, um, the Southwest. Um, we fund in Illinois and up to about um, Georgia. And we, what we're doing is we're funding people on the grassroots level. Um, and encouraging people to articulate the problems and challenges they have um, and trying to strengthen the capacity in low-income communities and among low-income families uh, to not only articulate those challenges but to build structures um, and to build communication structures so that they are articulating and sharing their experiences and building coalitions um, with an even broader community but also building, building power. Um, in their own community so that they can have a seat at the table um, so that people will engage and will listen with them, but also recognizing that ultimately to get anything done, you have to have a coalition. You know, Senator Kennedy used to tell me in the Senate melody, one person can stop anything. So you've got to constantly look for ways to build coalition and to find partners that may be unlikely partners. I mean, one of the communities that we've just an example for one of the communities that we've that Margaret Casey has funded, you know, people would talk about the fact that, you know, they had you know uh, a wage issue that they found to be particularly important. Another part of the community said we've got childcare um, concerns that we found particularly important. And sometimes some of those concerns could be in friction with one another. But when they sat down and there was support for infrastructure to help them sit down and engage, they started to look for ways to come up with consensus and ways that they could move forward together. So I believe the infrastructure that's necessary to support uh, grassroots uh, power building, but also uh, grassroots alignment and partnership and coalition building with other parts of the community, not only helps people to understand and get past some of the friction, but also helps to create solutions so that people can create momentum and greater understanding of what those challenges may be. Yes. You mentioned Boston is a place you've spent time at. Have you been involved with Europe at all? Yes, I'm so glad you asked about Europe. <laughs> Sure. Um, I'm actually on the, the national board for Europe. And Europe, for those of you who don't know, is an organization that was started probably about 17 or 18 years ago by a man named Gerald Chertavian. And Gerald was in financial services, and he started mentoring a young, young man. And one, he realized how talented this young person was. And two, he realized he's talented, and he he is at risk, he is not successful, he doesn't have access to opportunity, not because he isn't, he, he lacks the, the drive, but because he lacks opportunity. And as Gerald often says, um, there, there is strength and there is intelligence every, in every zip code, but not opportunity in every zip code. So ultimately, this idea became an organization called Europe meaning that we provide about six months of in-classroom training to young people, opportunity youth, um, who 
are vulnerable in many ways. They may not have they may have a GED, but they don't have a post-secondary credential. They may have um, come into challenges with the juvenile justice system. You kind of pick your challenge. Um, they come to Europe, and not only are they provided with technical skills and uh, technology and financial services, um, a couple of different inter uh, industries that are sectors that we focus on, but also what I call power skills. People call them soft skills. I think that's a misnomer, but power skills. I mean. What does it mean to go to work every day, to show up on time every day? How you engage with your supervisors? How do you write your resume? You know, those kinds of skills. And then they have a six month internship. Um, our partners include everyone from American Express to JP Morgan Chase to State Street Bank, and the list goes on and on. And what we have found in this program, and it's been tested, um, uh, randomized controlled trials, you know, kind of platinum level of testings, in terms of its success is that over and over and over again, not only are our interns successful, but they are either being hired by the employer that hired them as an intern, or they're being hired in other parts of the economy. We have some partners that have asked us to come to their uh, community or to build out our work in their communities, not so that they can hire two interns, that's, that's nice, but that's philanthropy, that's a nice thing to do, but to literally hire hundreds of the students that are coming through our program. What we're doing now is we're focusing on putting our model into community college, and this goes to this issue of systemic change, um, because we're finding if we work in community colleges, not only can we drive down the cost of what we're doing, but we're also part of a larger system. So young people that are coming to community college can engage and enroll in our program. They are also getting an associate's degree, they're getting work experience, um, and they are getting uh, connected to employers and that kind of uh, employer and on-the-job training. And when they finish, they're armed both with that credential, but also with that work experience. And we have uh, programs all over the country. Thanks for sharing that. I have one other question to that. We have been a group of us who talked to Yara out of Boston mm -hmm. about possibly considering I do. Mm -hmm. One of the yeah, one of the challenges because I'm on the board and I've talked to them about Richmond and I had been told Richmond was too small as well. One of the things that we're doing, they're expanding the in Richmond, not because of me, but in part because of the need for some of our students starting to expand that footprint um, down from the national capital region to Richmond. Um, so we'll start to have some year up presence in Richmond and see if we can build it out. But one of the things that we do and we've learned over time when we've tried to start programs in various places, a couple of things, and here's a piece of advice too. When we go in, we are looking to see A, if there's an employer, employer base that can support the internships, that will support the seats for students. Um, as well as enough philanthropic support to support the model and get it up and running. Um, and also looking at demand um, that exists in that community. Um, I have seen, and I can name cities and I, I won't, um, but there are a number of cities of various sizes that have come to us and say, we really want a Europe proposal. Sometimes time after time after time, particularly if a proposal has been put together and a group has been put, um, been put together that show, okay, this will make this program sustainable in this community, you know, it, it allows the leadership to look at and rethink the opportunity and whether or not a community could sustain the program. I can promise you, because I, I know Gerald quite well now, his desire to get to scale and to help the millions and millions of young people that we think would be benefited by this program is unmatched. What the concern is, is he's always looking at is, can we sustain the program? Can the program be viable um, in a community? And so that's the threshold question. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yes. You know, Kalamazoo is kind of a pond of blue and a sea of red. <laughs> you're, you're speaking to a group of pretty much community activists, most of us here. Um, and I'm sure that, that you're aware that with this uh, recent issue we've been having with the homeless people, that they have been 
you know, I think appropriately talking about housing needs to be a right, mental health services need to be a right. I think they've been mistakenly attacking our city government when it's been the cuts in HUD funding and the cuts in state and federal mental health funding that have taken away the resources that would have been there to address the very issues that they're trying to speak to. Um, you know, similarly, you talked about economic inequality increasing through 2000. It's getting, as you're, you're well aware, it's, getting, it's gotten much worse since 2000 up until today. And if we look at the recent tax plan, and if we look at the current housing and urban development, which removes racial discrimination as a factor in, in, in housing spending, um, that uh, at least in terms of current policy, the fact that forces that have been moving us towards greater economic inequality are getting worse, not better. So yeah, we are completely, I mean, you're talking to a, to, a, to a group, to a community that believes in community action, but I wonder if it's disingenuous to think that it's going to be, well, that, 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 it, that what we're facing is a situation of one step forward locally, two steps backward nationally, and in, Mich in Michigan we have recently statewide. And, and I'm sorry, because I was listening, I was like, oh yeah, I, I agree, I agree. D tell me. Just state your question for me. I wonder if it's, if it's um, um, I mean, we all, we all agree about the importance of community action, mm -hmm. but I wonder if it's, a, if, it's a, if it's a mistake to think that in a context where one step forward at the community happens at the same time as two steps backward at the state and federal level, that community action can solve the issue. Oh, I see what you're saying, sure. I don't think that well, one, I don't think that there are any single-shot answers to the challenges that sit in front of us right now. What I do believe is that elections at the national level are critical. Um, I believe there's some deeper work that needs to happen at the national level as well that isn't just a political question. I think we have foundational, and I try to touch on this, foundational American civilization questions that are in front of us right now. but. It also is important to win elections because that will shape budgets. Um, that will hopefully try to move us in a better direction in terms of how programs are funded and what kinds of our things are funded. But at the same time, I also don't believe that we can just wait for that to happen. Um, I don't believe, because I don't know what's going to happen in November, and I don't know what's going to happen November two years from now. We could look very much like we look right now after the election in 2020. And if we choose to wait for that change without doing anything, I think the situation becomes worse for us. I do believe that there are activities that are taking place on the local level, also on the state level, that are important, that are absolutely critical to either trying to hold the line or to try and move us in a direction, I and for me, I would say it's a more progressive um, and important direction to address some of the needs that exist. And we also have to do that looking at different kinds of funding tools, diff looking at social impact tools so that we can take advantage of or use the resources that are available to us now to A, do the best that we can in our communities, and we have to do that with the community, which is part of my argument, um, and simultaneously, while we're doing that, that we can also experiment. We can identify what's working and what's not working so that when the opportunity arises on the national level that we can do something positive, that we have a, po a policy environment that allows us to move forward. We've tested some of these things, and we see what's working. We also then are building momentum across communities. If Kalamazoo and Philadelphia, which has a shared prosperity um, program, Richmond, Virginia, which has a community wealth building program, and I can list others are doing similar kinds of work and we're testing things and we're talking to each other and we're figuring out what works and what doesn't, then what happens when we have an opportunity at the federal level is to take a federal proposal and to try and get either the policy in place that supports what's happening locally and or do something on the federal level um, that takes that to, ev to scale at an even larger level. For me, it isn't an either or. I think when we, you know, when we put all of our eggs in the federal basket and ignore the states, 
that we find ourselves, and the localities, we find ourselves in trouble. And when we do the opposite, we find ourselves in trouble. I really do believe it is a chew gum and walk and run at the same time proposition. Earlier today, Melody, you were talking uh, uh, some about uh, the work that you're doing at the University of Virginia, and the, uh, my question really is about the potential and the best examples that you can think of of universities getting involved in addressing these challenges to democracy, including the foundational issues that you talked about having to do with inequality and building a more just and equitable uh, and fair society. Sure. Uh, well, one, I think that universities have an important role to play in doing that. I know, Annette, I don't know what your experience was, but certainly when I was sitting in my office, the ability to call on researchers and experts, you know, whether you're doing something formal like you're putting together a new bioethics commission, or whether you are trying to think through policy ideas, or whether you're drawing upon policy ideas. Some of the nut nuggets or the heart of some of the policy ideas that we are living with today come from you know, academics kind of scratching on these issues and thinking through these issues. So I think universities play a critical role. And one of the things that I've seen, and I'll talk about UVA in a second, but just living in Richmond, you know, there are several universities there. Virginia Commonwealth University, which started as a small commuter school, now 30,000 students in the heart of the city. The University of Richmond, which is a small liberal arts school, a um, very wealthy small liberal arts school, now get really becoming much more diverse and much more engaged um, in the life of the city. There's an HBCU, Virginia Union University, and then a large community college um, system there. And all of them are playing fascinating roles um, in the city right now, um, whether it's the way the students are going out into the community and the kind of work they're doing, um, whether it's the research that they're doing about the city. I, I was talking about the deaths of the despair and some of the new research about uh, what's happening in communities of color. Um, that's coming from VCU scholars um, that have been focusing on those issues. Um, also, we are building there's a new culinary institute um, that's going up. Richmond has, I sound like now the Chamber of Commerce for Richmond. Richmond has a wonderful restaurant scene. Um, but Richmond has great restaurants. Um, but building out uh, career pathways, connecting the community college um, to the, the culinary institute um, is a program that's up and running. A new uh, uh, infrastructure is being built for that right now. So there are lots of ways that I'm seeing uh, universities play an important role in the life of the, of the city and the state and the nation. Um, at the University of Virginia, one of the things we noticed when we were doing, thinking about the democracy initiative, um, is what is already happening in the United States on this issue. And there are a couple of really, and surprisingly, just a couple of other large universities that are doing this work. One of them is focused solely domestically. Um, and one of them um, is uh, not interdisciplinary in its work. What we're seeking to do is an interdisciplinary approach that is both domestic and global. And we have identified five pillars and one core pillar um, that we will be focusing on. So citizenship uh, and race and religion, uh, economic growth and mobility, media, uh, world engagement, and um, the role of democratic institutions, and then a core focus on the history and philosophy of democracy. And in each of those pillars, there will be labs that PhDs and, and uh, PhD students and postdocs and professors and undergraduate students, and also engaging with practitioners and policymakers will be participating in these labs. Um, they will propose big questions, and uh, labs will be selected to run for three or five to five years. To, to really grapple with these questions and the solutions. And at the same time, putting this information out into the bloodstream, engaging with policymakers, engaging with business leaders. We're also going to do a World Democratic Forum every two years. Uh, this coming May, we'll have what we're calling PresFest, which will be focused on, domestically focused on the presidency. And it is an attempt to answer the question, what, does a public, what role does a public university play in a democracy? And we feel, particularly given our founding, 
you know, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe laid the cornerstone for the University of Virginia, particularly given the friction and tension that's been inside the university and the university with the community, uh, and issues of, of race and, and class, that it is important for us to take this issue on and that it is important for us to say something and to do something that will contribute to the life of democracy both here in the United States and in the world. So that is the goal, uh, and we are just getting started. Yeah. So what would you think about the university getting a building in the poorest sections of the community mm -hmm. and bringing down social work students, our health people, people from the different departments, being a part of that community, sort of like settlement houses did in the early 1900s? You mean a, you mean a community, a university? Doing that? Oh, I didn't know if you're asking about you. This university? Well, maybe this university. Well, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> For example. For example, I feel like I'm sitting here. <laughs> Yeah, I've been in politics for a while. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think it's a very interesting idea. I mean, what I, I think is um, the idea of taking education out of the classroom and moving education in community uh, is exciting. Uh, it's exciting opportunity for students. Um, it, is, it can be an exciting opportunity um, for a university. Uh, so. I know it is something that we are hoping to do um, at UVA. I've seen done at other places. Um, so I think as you all move forward, it'll be an interesting conversation that you all will have here. <laughs> <laughs> is that a? It kind of is. I'm, I'm just thinking out loud. My parents are from Jamaica. I lived in Jamaica for two years. And it was interesting moving from Chicago and to be in a, in a place where people share an identity. Um, mm -hmm. And talking about like food, culture, people sounding the same, even though they looked different. Mm -hmm. And when I think of like people collectively like agreeing with policy, and when I think of people um, not buying into like narratives around poverty and like what that means for people who like Assuming that people who are poor are bad people or poor. I think of like having a shared identity. Um, and what kind of work, or what would it look like to uh, um, I guess what would it look like for America to kind of push towards like a, mm. a shared identity mm. so we could actually see people in humane ways? I think that is a great question. It is one of the big questions that sits in front of us and what is possible. And it is one I think about and am grappling with and I don't know the answer to that uh, yet. I, I hope one day I will, <laughs> um, but I don't. I do think, and there are several things I think about in that context. Um, you know, I, I think about our founding and the complexity of our founding and uh, the complexity, and I say this part in a very positive way, of who we are, and the different experiences that we all have historically and how we come here. And I, I, don't, know, I don't know that that's going to be it, given our construct, um, or if it will, or if it could be, you know, how we attach to or think about larger goals for ourselves and for society. Uh, I do believe, and this is such a big challenge for us, I do believe that we have to have honest conversations about what we have been. Um, as <laughs> People often say you can't have, you know, you talk about truth and reconciliation, you can't have reconciliation until you have truth. Um, but so I think that we have to grapple with that more openly and we have to move beyond some of the mythology um, that has shaped our nation and created power in our country. And that's going to be really difficult. 
um, and that's why you were I was talking about power is you were asking your your question I think and the young woman who's left was asking her question um, one of the things I've been thinking about is the importance of power in these conversations and the importance of community in these conversations and those two things in many ways seem antithetical to one another or are they I don't know right now you're literally listening to me I mean these are the thoughts that go around in my head as I think about the these questions because they're big and hairy and difficult and there are certainly some people who are writing on these questions right now who think we'll never be there I mean and you know we might as well let's just call it what it is and and that's not who I am I'm 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 always optimistic and always looking, um, looking for the way and the path forward. There's a book that, um, and I can't remember if he won the National Book Award. I think he won the National Book Award, but the author is Ibram Kendi. Um, it's a book called Stamped from the Beginning. And if you are familiar with Winthrop Jordan's book, White Over Black, which is kind of the, a big magnus, magnum opus um, on some of these issues, Kendi's book is being articulated as kind of picking up from there. And he is writing about some of these issues. And it's interesting, even as he's writing about them and grappling with them, I, I saw him recently at a meeting. And he says, but I'm really optimistic. <laughs> um, and I feel that way too, but I just feel like this is a big, complicated puzzle. And I don't quite know how all the pieces should snap together yet. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I hear we the people or we are one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think if we ever become one, we can get to share. Well, and it's, you know, I often think about, and it's one of my favorite quotes, the James Baldwin quote about children. For they are all our children. We will profit by or pay for what they become. I mean, think about it. Just think about it. If we thought about children, they are all our children. It would change everything, um, but it is how we get there. How do we? How do we get there? How do we get that sense of shared identity, shared community? But that is why I talk about and think a lot about community engagement and think about community, because I think it is so essential. It is so core. And even in all the work that I've done, and you know, thinking about policy issues and looking at charts and graphs and all that kind of thing. You know, along the way in the work I've done with Europe and other organizations, one of the things I think about is love. You know, what, what if we loved all children in the way we love our own children? What if we loved each other that way? And, it, and people are like, oh, that sounds so, but that's hard and that's complicated. But if we did, things would look different. Things would be different. Yes. Hello. <laughs> what is the name of the organization? You're up, you're up, like you are I'm smiling because people always um, say it's year up. So a year up. Like oh. year, Y E A R, second word up. <laughs> year up. <laughs> I know. Said quickly, it sounds like you're up. <laughs> Well, and I, I think, I mean, that technically there's the technical and then there's kind of the, mm -hmm. the nomenclature and the, the emotional. I mean, and technically we were founded as a constitutional republic. Um, and there are liberal, not in the liberal conservative, but liberal democratic I ideas. 
Um, and we have articulated ourselves as a democracy. And we often use those terms interchangeably, uh, but we often also don't talk about and, and teach you know, what they mean so that as we're using them, people understand you know, technically this is what a constitutional republic is, this is how we were founded, we are not a direct democracy, you know, we consent to be governed, we elect people to govern, et cetera. But then when we talk about democracy, um, that has a, almost a, a literary <laughs> feel for, for us in the way that we articulate and think about ourselves. Uh, I think one of the things, though, that is most critical is civic, in, in civic education for children. I mean, that's also one of the things in the Democracy Initiative at UVA that we are thinking about is how to help educators and through our School of Education think about civic education and what that kind of curriculum can look like um, for young people because so, so many people don't understand how we're founded and what this means and you know my my husband who was born in Los Angeles but we he and his mother moved to Canada where her family was when he was two so he was educated there and so he has a foot in both worlds you could see us you can imagine during the Olympics when hockey comes on it's not pretty in our household um, but um, and he often says you know so many people in America don't really understand America <laughs> it would be great if Americans better understood America. Now, he's an American, too, but he hops on that side of the 49th parallel when he's doing, saying that stuff. Um, but the bottom line is I think that kind of education is, is critical and, and important and getting it right and also understanding what language we're, what language we're using when and why and, and what that means. So I guess with that... Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melody. What a wonderful presentation. Um, if you would like to know more about uh, uh, and to talk more about what we can do as a university, uh, and I'm particularly uh, interested in the Shared Prosperity Initiative, but there are many other ways that universities, our university in particular, has been and will continue to be involved uh, uh, in working to make this truly we, the people, our community, our, our society, our democracy. Uh, we have a long ways to go. Uh, we've got a long ways to go before children growing up in certain parts of uh, our city of Kalamazoo have an equal chance to prosper uh, as children growing up in more affluent areas. Um, let's work together and see if we can make that happen. Thank you.